You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney, and welcome again! Yes, we're going to have an interesting show here today. Do I say that every time? I don't know. It's hard to tell which show is your favorite. They're all my favorite, like my children. (laughs) Except my favorite child. You know which one you are. Wink, wink. Either way, for the majority of the show, we're going to be sitting down and having a conversation with Alan Smith. He's my new friend, and I think he's going to be your new friend, too. But, 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 don't let me get ahead of myself. No, no, no. So I've welcomed you. If you've been here before, you're, you're very most welcome here. Well, except for you, and you know who you are. But if you're new, Snarky Faith is a show where, hey, we kind of talk about the insanity of Christianity and kind of really try to figure out, hey, where's, uh, where's there any kind of, where does it make sense? where we kind of like to talk about the Jesus parts, not the Looney Tune parts. Well, actually, we do talk a little or a fair amount about the Looney Tune parts, just for reference, just for reference and snarkiness and sarcasm, which brings me to tell you that, yes, if you're choosing to embark upon this journey, uh, you are willing to endure copious amounts of sarcasm and probably also some of this. We good? All right, let's go ahead and begin. I mean, and the best place to begin, if you're asking me, like, my opinion, like, if you'd actually like to know, I mean, if you really want to know, I think we should go ahead and start with the Christian crazy of the week. Here we go. Claude Hammers, the Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. Yes, the Christian crazy of the week where we show you the the choicest cuts of meat from the insanity of Christianity. And this week, we're kind of going with really the digest edition here uh, where we're trying to kind of slim it down. Keep it brief. Keep it nice and tight. Now, Ricky Joyner's not your kind of typical cream of the crap Christian crazy. Now, is he crazy? Oh, yes. He's got that in spades. And does he profess to be a Christian? Well, sure. It all kind of fits together. And we have him on here today. Mm-hmm. Because I, 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 what I wanted to do is to give you kind of a snapshot of the insanity that we're dealing with now as the election is ramping up. The, the craziness that the conservative Christians is something that we need to be aware of. And as much as I like to make fun of these things, and we'll do that, don't worry about it. It's also kind of scary when you begin to hear these people that are trying to raise up people to do acts of violence. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Rick Joyner, so if you don't know who he is, don't worry. Don't beat yourself up. I would rather less people know who he is. But (laughs) for these purposes, he's free game for us to mock. No, he's in charge of Morningstar Ministries, and by chance, Morningstar Ministries, you know what they had done? They purchased Heritage USA, if anyone, anyone, anyone. Heritage USA was from PTL, PTL, Jim Baker. <laughs> Jim Baker did a bunch of weird stuff with people's money and uh-huh, Ponzi did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Rick Joyner came in, bought it up, and Rick, Rick is kind of an end times nutbag. But you know what? I'm going to let him say some of his crazy for now because we're doing this here. Mockery for a reason is at least how I sleep at night. So, hey, Rick, yeah, give us a little flavor of that crazy stank because we can all smell it. We're in time for war. We need to recognize that. We need to mobilize. We need to get ready. Uh, I'm talking to law enforcement, talking to people, uh, one of the things I saw in a dream I had 
related to our Civil War was... Civil War? Dream? Oh, <laughs> makes you more credible. Tell me. Tell me your dreams. Your dreams of the apocalypse. This, this sounds about as interesting as Zack Snyder's version of... I'm sorry, people. The Snyder Cut's just not going to do it for all of your fanboy or fangirl's wet dreams out there. The closest I can come to it is Rick Joyner. Yeah, come on. He's at least got a little flair, a little humor, because every time his mouth is moving, it's kind of funny, right? Militias would pop up like mushrooms. Ooh! And it was God. These were good militias. Ooh. We need to recognize the times, need to be prepared for them. If God's people don't become a part of the militia movements, uh, the good militia, the bad people will take them over. So there's the good militias and the bad militias, and we just need to go as Christians and go lead militias because that's... In the Bible, because Jesus loved militias, I'm not too sure where you're going here with this, Rick. Because it doesn't sound very New Testament. Not very kind of Jesus, self-sacrificial, like Jesus loving others. Doesn't really, I mean, I'm not really sure your theology and how you're reading scripture. Oh, wait, go ahead. You can do it. Tell me. Tell me exactly what Jesus said. Well, Jesus himself said, there's going to be a time when you need to sell your coat and buy a sword. Now, that was a physical weapon of their day. And we're in that time here. We need to realize that. See, all joking aside, crazy bullshit like this is why we do the Christian crazy. Because, he, well, I shall show you in a very quick example here of how Rick Joyner has no idea how to read scripture. But I'm pretty sure he owns a concordance. So the sleight of hand that Rick is performing here is the fact that he is quoting from Scripture. He's quoting from Luke 22. Uh, when And this is giving you a little bit of context. Luke 22, after the Last Supper, Jesus is going to go to the Mount Olives to pray. That we're kind of moving along that he's going to die soon part of the narrative. Yes. Okay. So Luke 22, 35, Jesus tells them, the disciples, when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. And then he said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell out your cloak and buy one. This is it. So Rick Joyner is saying, militias make sense because Jesus said for us to go and buy a sword. Easiest way for me to sum this up was that during that time, being able to travel with a Roman sword was a very common thing when people traveled throughout the countryside. Fairly common. It's not a huge sword. It's uh, under two feet. It's just something that most people carried. That was called a Roman sword. Fairly common for that to happen, right? Um, Jesus is also in this context speaking about, hey, when I sent you guys out before, you guys were fine. I sent you out, God took care of it, you did your own thing. You guys gonna go out again? That's going fine. Yeah, you can take that with you, good. Just go, be safe, go out and do your thing. That's it. Form a militia? No. Go out and kill people? No. No, 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 no. None of that, none of that is true. None of that is true. None of this has to do with military or anything, anything at the matter. You could even say it's malicious. But the fact of the matter is this. His reading of scripture is, is devoid from reality. None of this has anything to do with what the disciples have been taught, first and foremost. Secondly, this isn't even part of some sort of orthodoxy or orthopraxy in the early church. It just doesn't make sense in context. And I'd like to remind dear Mr. Joyner this. It comes from Revelation. If you want to get and play that game. Revel <laughs> Revelation 13.10. If you kill with a sword... With the sword, you must be killed. And here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. You see, the heart of God tells us to keep going, to keep having endurance, to keep doing good. Because that is the heart of the kingdom of God. It's that simple. No militia, just Jesus. It's pretty easy. All right. Yeah, you got it. I think you got it. Hey, now let's go ahead and move on to our interview. Today I've got the privilege for sitting down having a conversation with Alan Smith. Alan Smith is an ex-evangelical pastor. He's also a freelance writer and 
I'm, I want to go ahead and extend this. I probably think new friends. This is a new online friends here. I mean, it may be too soon. Uh, maybe I'm jumping the shark on this, but uh, but yes, new online friend that I that I've met recently. So this conversation shall be interesting enough uh, because I also feel like a bit of this is going to be just us kind of uh, getting to know each other. So in the midst of, of of getting to know Alan, hopefully we're just going to have a good chat here today, Alan. Right. How are you, Alan? Yep, Sorry. Look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm really awesome. excited to be on the program with you. Thanks for the invite. So, Alan, like today, I kind of uh, we're going to kind of be talking through some different um, some different ideas, and and I had uh, I kind of got to know you online a little bit through some of uh, one of your side gigs that you're doing. Uh, you've got a YouTube channel where you're doing um, really just teachings that I kind of like that you're just you're unpacking things uh, that you feel like evangelicals I think need to either be challenged on or need to kind of understand better. Would that be correct? I think that's very accurate. Challenging evangelical assumptions. That's kind of my like my that. goal. Yeah. So challenging evangelical assumptions. So for a person, um, I want to get into your story a little bit too, because you were a pastor, an evangelical pastor for 25 years. And so we're going to pick through your brain a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about the evangelical brain today. Um, sure. Uh, or the former evangelical brain, maybe. I should uh, that we're way, recovering, but, recovering. Recovering, recovering. That's <laughs> it. We're, we're all there, brother. We're all there. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, Alan, tell us a little bit about your story because um, I, I always kind of find it interesting for for people that have gone through this kind of journey in faith to where, at least for me, it was like you kind of enter into ministry because you feel like you need to be doing this thing for God, and right. then you kind of get caught up in like the institutionalized uh, BS of ministry, and sure. then you start to ask like questions and stuff, and then eventually your time will probably get pushed out for asking right. too many questions. So, so that was kind of my experience, but I want to kind of talk through some of yours. So yeah, tell us a little about your story. Yeah, I think I probably resonate with a lot of your story. I, I grew up in, you know, the 1980s, early 90s, uh, charismatic, evangelical. Uh, it was a happened to be United Methodist Church, but it might as well have been a non-denominational charismatic evangelical church in its flavor. And uh, very much... Uh, you know, purity culture uh, in the days before uh, How I Kissed Dating by even came out, you know, we could have written it. Uh, it was very much, you know, every year at camp burning all your secular CDs because they're the devil's music and then having to replace them all <laughs> a few weeks later. You know, it was that kind of thing. And, you know, I really love the Lord. I, I had some encounters with God growing up and it was very genuine. And so my faith was uh, not by no means mature, but it was genuine. And, uh, but I was in a social culture where, you know, if you really love Jesus, you went into ministry. And since I really did love Jesus, uh, at some point I, you know, answered the call and went to Bible college and, you know, launched into the, the, the journey of being a part-time youth pastor slash worship leader. And, uh, you know, had some failed church plant experiences and, uh, had a, you know, was on staff at a mega church for seven years, uh, one of 150 full-time pastors there. And, uh, you know, just, that's what I did. I was an evangelical pastor and, I, and, you know, my process of exiting evangelical thinking was very gradual and I didn't even realize it was happening until I was pretty far into the journey. Mm. And, and then, you know, you've got the those years where you you're now aware that you're no longer thinking within that box, but yet your paycheck still depends upon thinking within that box. And so you've got the internal tension mm -hmm. that's building and building and building and building. And, you know, there's aspects of that I really handled well and aspects of it that I, I really mishandled in, in some significant ways. But, you know, it, it eventually just came to a head and, you know, about a year and a half ago, I resigned from, the, uh, my position as a senior pastor in the church I'd planted. And, uh, wow, what a liberating experience to be able to think whatever I want to think and ask whatever questions I want to ask and express whatever opinions I want to express. And, you know, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but it's just nice to not have to try to keep everybody happy anymore within a set of assumptions that I no longer hold. So in that, um, so as, so let's, 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 let's talk about you as back in your pastor role where you start to see kind of in your, in your faith, you have questions. Right. And, and maybe even though some of those questions maybe start to, 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 to form cracks um, in right. some, in some of your assumptions, like what, what were some of those early, early nagging questions or things that started to crack? 
Yeah, there. I mean, it goes back pretty far. Like even in in Bible college in my late teens, early twenties, uh, I remember taking a course uh, that dealt a lot with Genesis one, two, and three. Mm. And but really, from an approach that was quite metaphorical, you know, fit the figurative language, making a big deal about the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, and it, very figurative. But the overall college had a had a fundamentalist approach to young earth creationism. Uh, and so there was a tension even there from the way that class was approaching scripture to the way that I was being required in the Bible college to approach scripture. And, and so e- even then, what I noticed in myself was an appetite mm-hmm. for thinking outside the box, mm-hmm. you know, and I've got enough of a love for science, not that I'm a scientist, but young earth creationism was never something that I could you know, get my head around as a, as a thing. And, uh, you know, my grandpa's a physicist and my uncle's a physicist and my cousin's a physicist. And I just had enough science crammed into me as a young man that I, I never could go there. But it, it's not just that I shifted opinions and rejected young earth mm-hmm. creationism. With that comes a shift in how you approach scripture itself, mm-hmm. where the literalistic approach is to some degree abandoned. And then once you start applying that less literalistic lens to other aspects of scripture, then different things begin to shift. Like I remember in my, uh, probably my early thirties, uh, you know, I know all the verses that talk about what women can't do in church. <laughs> right? And I grew up in church settings where they were pretty strictly applied. You know, women were allowed to do children's ministry or women's ministry. And that was about it. Uh, but then you start taking that different set of lenses where you're not quite so literalistic and you're willing to look more at the culture and the original audience. And you're, you're just, it's a more of a critical approach to the text itself. And you apply that and all of a sudden, you know, you, you can have women elders and you can have women preaching and and you, and you have ways that you look at the language. Maybe that's not what Paul was quite getting at. and, Mm -hmm. And, and, and that was okay. It was like, Within my evangelical circles, empowering women was uncomfortable for some, but generally embraced. Hmm. Uh, not in every setting, but generally. But then you take that same lens and start applying it to, you know, Romans one when it comes to what it says about homosexuality, and you start at you eventually reach the boundary of no questions allowed. Mm-hmm. And I started reaching that boundary probably on a number of fronts. Uh, in the last 10 years, you know, it, and where I was having, you know, uh, just inner wrestling with seeing some things in scripture differently than what I had been told was the required kind of party line, uh, everything from politics and the assumption that, you know, Jesus is a Republican, uh, to, you know, my, approach to sexuality and gender and sexual orientation. And it was just a lot of different, you know, the atonement and what exactly was happening at the cross and the authority of scripture itself and whether it's inerrant or infallible. I mean, you could just go through the list and pretty much anything that would make somebody specifically an evangelical Christian, I ended up rejecting it. Mm. Uh, Not that I am not a believer in Jesus anymore. uh, It's just that Christianity is a lot bigger than evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. And, and so I've, I, in my deconstruction, I didn't become an agnostic or an atheist or anything or an unbeliever. Uh, I still consider myself very much uh, a Christian, but definitely not an evangelical. Mm-hmm. Is that, yeah, for my experiences within that too, I think that you, you, you said something very interesting within that. And, um, and I'll, I'll ask you, would you agree or not with this? Um, because it's a synthesis that I kind of came at from from being in around in that, and is that at least over the past, it feels like twenty years or so that evangelicalism has kind of like shifted to being more about like agenda than like about gospel. Um, you know, it's it, it's become more about more like I felt like more of some sort of a political coercion than it is about Jesus. I almost feel like in a certain way we'll talk about Jesus when we need to, but like the ways of Jesus kind of, we kind of will push those back and we only do that when we need salvation. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that the agenda, uh, and this is human. I mean, it's not like evangelicals are the only people guilty of this, (laughs) but, but it, 
it just becomes about power Mm -hmm. and about uh, influence and about feeling like I'm on the right team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, you know, it's it reminds me of, you know, how fundamentalism came into being is, you know, there was this sense of we're under attack amongst American, primarily Southern evangelicals, where liberalism, oh, God, was creeping in from Europe into our seminaries. And so the fundamentalist movement was a reactionary, let's circle the wagons uh, and declare, here are the questions that are not allowed to be asked. Mm. And, you know, the, the topics that we know what the Bible says, and it's no longer up for discussion. And, and, and then the benefit of that is once it's comforting because once you've embraced that fundamentalist approach to really anything, Mm -hmm. it's so comforting to know that you're right and that you're part of the tribe that's right. And so now whether it's social issues and the, and the culture wars or whether it's politics and partisan, you know, the, all the polarism, polarity that's happening there, it, there really is more, it's less about, Jesus and what does it look like to live in the way of Jesus? And it's become more defending our confession, defending our statement of faith, defending our moral positions, our political positions. It becomes a reactionary defensive move and we're no longer really following Jesus so much as we're protecting the status quo. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, okay. So run with me on this. And so how, how, how do you think about this? Because you were saying that in, in like a certain sense, and, and I, I think, I think you're right. Um, that evangelicals all, all boil down their beliefs into like certain sets of, I wouldn't necessarily say dogmas or credos. They, they don't sit in that way, but they end up, they, they, you know, we are anti, uh, we are anti this, we are anti this, right. we are for this kind of, kind of a way. But what ends up happening, what, what I've always felt like growing up within it is it ends up being kind of a cop out for, for people because they don't have to think. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it's just like, it's all oh, life is this. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it it is a very easy way to frame your perspective and it really takes a lot of uh, tension off of people because, Hey, you know, I don't have to worry about loving those people because they're just a bunch of sinners, you know, Oh man, I don't have to be around them anymore. This is amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Fundamentally it's anti-intellectual. Uh, when you make asking questions, uh, you know, not allowed, Mm -hmm. punishable. Uh, and there's all kinds of ways that you get punished in that environment if you ask questions, you know, uh, or even if you encourage others to ask questions, especially if you're a leader, mm-hmm. uh, you, you, you get punished into learning to not ask those questions and you learn where the boundaries are. But it becomes uh, anti-intellectual because now discipleship isn't about teaching you how to think. It's just teaching you what to think. And uh, here are it's, it's like a catechism where, you know, we've pre-programmed what all the questions and what all the answers are. And your, your responsibility is really just to be able to memorize it and regurgitate it. And no, nobody learns to think for themselves. And if you think about Jesus, you know, his whole teaching uh, approach, whether he was saying this overtly or not, was you've heard it said, but I say to you, mm-hmm. you know, he is constantly challenging the assumptions of the religious tradition that was surrounding him and trying to move them uh, out of some of those traditions into something richer, fuller, bigger, more expansive, more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I, I I think that there's such a tendency to celebrate that Jesus did that 2000 years ago, but to think that it's not our job to follow him in that methodology today, that there is a, what are the religious traditions I've been handed Mm. and what would it look like to approach that from a, you've heard it said, but I say to you Mm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. I like that. And, and so from your perspective, okay. So, so uh, in many ways, like the mindset is, is leading people towards away from thinking. um, Right. And, and you're also saying as a pastor, the, uh, the goal is not too many questions. Like kind of yep. keep it going, keep keep the machine moving. Sure. Now, 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 how does that impact you um, as a pastor back in the day when you begin having questions, you knowing you can't ask those questions or talk about those questions in church? And does that end up boxing out lots of scripture? You know, does that almost end up like really boxing you into what you can and can't speak about? Totally. Uh, and, you know, you learn that trial and error. Uh, you, you learn it when... 
you get up and you preach your heart out and somebody leaves the church, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or they quit giving uh, or they call that meeting, you know, where, hey, you offended me because you said this. And, you know, I I, I remember even uh, I was with a close friend that I mentioned, you know, that I, I no longer believed in kind of the traditional evangelical view of hell and eternal conscious torment. And him and his family left the church the next mm-hmm. week and they were close friends. Mm-hmm. And so how it affects you is it, 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 it affects the institution. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you, you have this, when you plant a church, especially you've got this idealistic, you know, idea that you're going to plant something organic. You're going to plant something non-institutional. We're going to do it different. And, invariably it becomes an institution, not a big one. I didn't have an impressively large church. It was small, but it still has a budget and it has a staff and it has bills to pay. And those bills have to get paid, which means people have to give, which means you have to keep those people happy. Mm-hmm. And and so you, you shift into uh, what do I need to present so that more people will come, so that more people will give, so that more people will serve. And so fewer people will leave. Mm-hmm. And None of that's malicious. It's not like, how can I be a manipulative monster? It's more, you, you couch it as, how can I be a good leader? How yeah. can I be an effective leader, an organizational leader? And, and, and so in my personal reading and study, I'm, I'm going for it as far as what do I really believe about this stuff? And then I'm trying to not let too much of that seep into my teaching and preaching, but I'm also trying to be genuine. <laughs> and, and and not just, uh, you know, toe the party line. And it just is too complicated. You know, after a while, it's it's no longer uh, sustainable mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, and I, I would say it, it took me into a depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did some pretty destructive things. And uh, uh, not to blame my deconstruction process Mm -hmm. for all those decisions, but just to say it was a factor. It was a complicating factor. It was just the inner tension of feeling like I was required to be in this box called ministry to begin with. uh, And that now that I was in it, I was stuck in it. And I wasn't even really allowed to think outside of it without fear of punishment. Mm -hmm. It really took a toll. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it it and and when you get in that position, and I think that this is one thing I think that a lot of people don't always understand. Um, and I'm not saying this is like oh people need to understand ministers better, but <laughs> but I, I, I but I think it like in a certain way just uh, pragmatically understanding this that that through a lot of the institutions and the systems that are set in place that you almost are forced to look at the congregation, forced to look at people in in in, in a way that's almost as like n- their numbers. They're not necessarily humans and it's yeah. subtle. It's subtle when it happens, subtle. but, but uh, it, it's a you, huge problem. Well, you can't help, but kind of track attendance and track giving. And so much of your budgeting is, is determined by projections based on those numbers. And, and to some degree, you're invariably, you don't mean to, but you're objectifying people by counting nickels and noses in that way. And, mm-hmm. At the same time, you're trying to love people well and serve them well. And then you've got the the tensions of I've got, you know, a chunk of the room out there that if I don't say something about the latest social injustice issue, uh, <laughs> that I'm just a coward, you know, that's afraid to speak to the issues. But if I do say something, half my church will leave. Mm-hmm. Uh And so I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. And it seems like whether it's the issues of of sexuality and gender or issues of race and social justice issues related to race, uh, that there's always some current event that half my group is waiting for me to say something Mm -hmm. and I better agree with them when I do. Mm. Uh, and that's a lot of pressure Mm -hmm. because you know, the, the, I've got people out there that are going to leave if I say anything, because it's not the gospel stick to the gospel. And then I've got people that will think I'm a coward if I don't say something. But then if I do say something, I better say what they already believe and not challenge them, or that's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. So it's just a ton of stress yes. to, to try to keep everybody happy and keep all those plates spinning. Mm. And w- which is interesting because that ends up being, and, 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 and by no means do I want to paint this as, as, as a uniquely evangelical problem. Right, sure. Uh, th- this this is a very uniquely institutional church problem. Yes, exactly. Um, I was I I was uh, 
gosh, I'm trying to think of where I was. I was, I was being interviewed. It was for another show. And, and um, they were asking me about uh, how I deconstruct stuff. And so they had said, fine, we, you talk about this, you say about this, how, you know, um, you know, how do we begin to fix things? Or why, why is this whole system broken? Because I talk a lot about the system being broken. Um, and so they were looking for some sort of almost programmatic fix, uh, which right. is, again, the way they think about it. And I was like, well, if you think about it, and this is more just ideological, that, that after being part, you know, of, of myself too, being parts of church plants, you begin to realize, like, from the very beginning, for a church to exist as an, as a, uh, we'll say, as an institution, um, as an institution, uh, a, or a business really kind of right. in many ways sure. as yeah. looked at, uh, well, a business's first impulse is keep the business alive. Yes. Um, it becomes self-protecting, self-perpetuating. Yes. And so, yeah. but the problem is with, I feel like with the movement Jesus created, the most important thing is loving people and loving others around us. So that, you know, so at, from the very start, we already have a huge ideological tension, right. um, which, That's which is exactly a hard that. one to mess with. And then when I say that to people, they're like, that's too much trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's you're you're really, really pinpointing a, a primary issue is mm -hmm. is that institutions, bureaucracies, however complex they are or not, uh, they Im almost immediately from their inception exist in order to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and all their decisions are about preserving, protecting, expanding that existence. And so they're very self protective and self-serving, and yet they're trying to present a gospel that in its very nature is supposed to be not self-protecting and not self-serving. Mm -hmm. And so that is a very fundamental incongruence that's difficult to uh, manage. And I know I know leaders, whether evangelical or not, but church leaders who seem better equipped to manage that tension than I ever was. Mm -hmm. I, I was pretty miserable at it. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one that, that, that tension bothered me the entire time where it was institution over people. Um, yeah. and I, I somehow like in my brain, like it would never fit. Um, and I right. try, and I try to do all sorts of gymnastics. Well, you know, they know better than me or God, maybe you'll fit. I don't, know. I did all this craziness just to be able to kind of keep myself numb to it so I could keep working, keep doing what I thought I was supposed to do. And for a long time, you think this is what God wants me to do. Mm -hmm. So if I don't walk this tightrope, I'll somehow be disappointing God. And then part of your deconstruction journey, at least mine was, mm -hmm. is you realize God isn't like that at all. Yeah. That this idea that was shoved down my throat as a teenager of the call of God on your life is just so much horseshit. Mm -hmm. And now, why am I even doing this? I don't need to do this, not just to keep the congregation happy. I don't have to do this to keep God happy. Yeah. And, and once that shift happened for me, and my eyes kind of lifted up from just head down trying to do my job to, oh, I could do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's where my, my days were numbered. It's just, mm -hmm. there, it was going to come to an end, healthy or not, whether the transition was great or not. Mm -hmm. it, there was there was a uh, point of no return mm -hmm. where I was definitely going to have to leave that, that environment. Mm -hmm. Now, and never go back, not reform it, not try to change it from the inside. I just want it out. And sometimes that's the best way. I, I feel like I've, I have for the, I've been a part of different organizations where I was, had gotten to myself in a position of, you know, on the leadership boards and things like that too, where you want to push that change. But right. eventually, and many times I always come to the point of realizing they tolerate me here <laughs> in this position, <laughs> but they would be happier if I wasn't pushing against this. I had to go back. I met with the current pastor of the church that I founded, uh, and I just had to apologize, you know, for a number of things. But re relevant to what we were talking about, I just had to own that for several years I had had a covert agenda to lead the church in a direction that was different from what we had covertly or overtly told people, mm. and, and that inconsistently, it, it wasn't uh, that inconsistency. It wasn't malicious in its intent, but it winds up being manipulative in its practice. Yep. And people feel that whether you intend it or not. And so people felt manipulated in ways that now looking back, I totally get it. I totally see it. Uh, but at the time I was just trying to juggle everything and balance everything and keep everybody happy. But I definitely was going down a road 
that was leaking into my leadership in a way that was trying to welcome that, encourage that, nurture that way of thinking in others. And people were like, wait a minute, this guy's leading us somewhere we don't want to go. And mm-hmm. it's different than where he said he was going. Mm-hmm. And so that disingenuousness of the leadership was just, it was a cancer in me and it ended up really hurting a lot of people. And I had to just go and say, Hey, it was wrong. You know, not, I, I, you can have right opinions and be wrong in the way you try to shove them down everybody's throat. And I was guilty of that. Uh, and just had to say, I was sorry. Hmm. Now, now for, for people out there too, like listening on the show, um, cause we've got folks that are, that are anywhere probably from still in church towards people that are <laughs> very far away from that. Um, right. usually when people are very far away from that, it's, it's for a reason. Um, right. uh, yeah. Yeah, they've been pushed to that place. But um, especially in regard to this, and I think this is this is what a lot of people uh, have struggled with, um, especially over like the Trump administration. Or ever since Trump has been well, the, in his own fiefdom of uh, yes, <laughs> since his own rule has been going on, is, is the fact of I, in many ways I feel like how much it has ruined. And this is evangelicals do not see this. I talk to them a lot, and they get really angry when I say this. But I'm like, do you do you not realize that that it is not Trump's fault, but but Trump has kind of have become the face of this, this thing that is just the disgustingness, the hypocrisy of evangelicalism, of conservative Christianity, especially in the way that they've worshipped him. And I feel like it's finally come to a head. Um, you know, this is this is years, years in the making, not even him. Don't give him credit for that. This is the moral majority. Yeah, yeah, this is, it's a long time. Yes. But it, yes, but it was such a time as this. We needed a, <laughs> a useful idiot and we got one. Um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and within that, but I but I think the one thing that people don't understand is, uh, and I want you to speak to, to this a bit, but the evangelical mindset and why Trump makes sense to them. Yeah, and I think it does it, it does go back way before Trump. Trump mm-hmm. is a symptom; he's not the disease. Uh, I, I think it goes. We touched on this before that there is a gravitation it's human towards power. And, you know, whereas what Jesus talks about in the kingdom has to do with serving selflessness. How can I get smaller? How can I get lower? How can I sacrifice myself for others? Uh, Human power is always a power that comes with muscle, with military power, with uh, influence, with the ability to punish, with the ability, you know, even in a, you know, a softer version of it, which our government intends to be, there's still the the threat of punishment that is ultimately how we control and get people to pay taxes and follow our laws and, and all those kind of things. And so uh, the failure to recognize the incongruence between uh, the the political power, which is always a power over that controls, and kingdom power – which is always a power that comes underneath to liberate. And there's no Venn diagram where those two things overlap. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are incongruent. They are oil and water. They do not mix. And I remember even in my childhood as the, you know, moral majority came into power that there was a sense in which we felt like the kingdom of God could come and be manifest if we just voted the right way and got, the right politician and the right party with the right platform into power. And you could talk all day about the pros and cons of one party platform over another. I'm not even talking about that. If we could just get a better platform, then it would work. I'm saying fundamentally it does not work. Uh, There is no, you know, Jesus is Lord or Caesar is Lord, Mm -hmm. and you can't have a a blend of the two. And I really think since Constantine, we've been trying. Mm -hmm. So this is not a new thing. Uh, And Trump is just, to me, uh, that trajectory taken to the point of ridiculousness, where now everything that the the moral majority was about, he misrepresents Mm -hmm. and is a distortion of if not the complete opposite of, and yet he's God's man simply because he, you know, it's like he has an R next to his name and that's it. Mm. Uh, Because he chose the Republican party, uh, which has the platform that endorses, you know, anti Roe v. Wade is the solution for abortion. 
uh, that and, and is going to supposedly, this is what they all say, put in Supreme Court justices that will overturn Roe. Now this becomes the way that the kingdom of God is going to come. And if you don't vote this way, then you hate babies. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's just, it becomes cartoonish uh, because it's way more nuanced and complex than that. And and I believe in being a good citizen. I'm going to vote in November. I'm not, mm-hmm. I, but there's a failure to recognize the limitations of political power. And we need to have a separation where we recognize the kingdom is something other. Mm. Uh, and there is a sense among evangelicals, especially in the South anyway, in my context, that equates, if you're a Christian, then you are a Republican. And I think that that's borders on heretical, you know, uh, uh, you know that kind of nationalism, that kind of uh, American exceptionalism, that kind of, you know, Monroe Doctrine, Manifest Destiny, uh, you know, we're kind of the new Israel, we're God's chosen nation. All of that is rooted in that way of thinking. And so it goes back a long, long way. Mm-hmm. It, it's rooted, it's white supremacist. It is. It is. It is in so many ways. And that's and, and what I've often thought about. And, and I think we even talked about this a little bit earlier being. A, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to just sit and paint people and say that they're intellectually lazy. Um, but I also I would say, like, I feel like it's not intellectual laziness, but I also feel like it's like m- ministerial laziness uh, for many Christians. I feel like for the call of Christ onto people's lives, for us to be able to go and to do, to be Jesus to our neighbors and things like that. I mean, right. I, I think those simple calls to us, <laughs> I think modern day, like uh, the way that the modern day church has handled it is, I don't know, we don't want to push people too hard. You know, we, we want to keep them comfortable because when they're comfortable, they're giving. And if we want to really tell them like, because I, I, this is, I've said this a bunch of times recently, but like the thing that grieves me the most about the pandemic is this should have been like the most glorious hour for the church where, where pastors are saying, don't worry about our live streams. You guys, we've been talking about this ad nauseum. Go and just do the Jesus stuff we talked about to your neighbors. We're good. Don't worry about live streams. Just go. Just, just do. go. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and instead, it's churches like, oh, we can't meet. Oh, we can't have enough people here. I don't want to wear a mask. Uh, you know, where it's become, it's, we've become very selfish. I mean, it's, which again, like you said, is very American. <laughs> the nice. church is very American now. It's um, very- spiritually just kind of overweight spiritually and just not very healthy not really understanding what the, the simplicity of the gospel yeah yeah consumeristic individualistic me focused all that stuff yeah and when when that's how you grow the church mm-hmm. uh and then it becomes institutionalized like we talk about and it, it, this is what you're going to get you know you you get uh, not that, not that I'm the be all end all intellectual. I, I'm not, I'm just, you know, read books by guys who are, but the, the intellectual laziness that is part of the evangelical movement is, is very stark to me. And frankly, uh, I see a lot of the same intellectual laziness on the progressive side, the mm-hmm. other side of the same coin. It, it's, you know, it's just the, you know, what is the who lyric, uh, meet the, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you, you wind up with just a different version of fundamentalism where there's also a lack of thinking and a party line and a tribal where now I'm on the right team. Uh, and it's, it ends up being just as mean and mean spirited and unthinking as, uh, a lot of conservative fundamentalism can be. I know. And you're, you're actually, you're absolutely right about that too, because I think that once, like you'd mentioned this earlier, this whole idea that the, the way that Jesus taught was, you know, you, you've known this, this is what you've been taught. Now look right. at this. And so I think right. that either wherever we're at, I think that we always have to be uh, challenging ourselves because anytime that we feel superior, we're comfortable. Um, <laughs> and if we're comfortable, we know we're not doing anything good. Um, maybe unless it's the weekend, but intellectually yeah. speaking, other than that, yes. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you this from two different perspectives. So from, since we were talking more about this from the, the, the pastoral mindset, um, is there something that you wish um, that your younger self, a bright-eyed stepping into ministry, that self, you know, that self is running into ministry, uh, is there one piece of advice that you wish that person knew? Yeah, if I could sit down with, you know, 18-year-old me, 
Uh, first of all, 18 year old weight me wouldn't have listened to 49 year old me. So <laughs> this hypothetical, me. Yeah. This hypothetical is complete fiction. Uh, but if I could, and if that version of me would listen, uh, I would love to talk to him about identity mm. uh, and about all the shoulds that drove me into all the major life decisions that were about trying to be somebody and gain something that I didn't have. I, I would love to have found some way to steer that young man in a direction that uh, was just more settled into something he already had mm. and just was was blind to. And a, a lot more of, of instead of what should you do, Alan, I would have asked questions like, what do you want to do? Mm. Uh, and w- with the idea that there's a spark of the divine and how those questions get answered, even in your immaturity, mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would love to be able to have those kind of conversations with that young man. I know for me, for me, a lot of it was, I always had this idea, I think from the way that we were taught about, you know, the narrow path. Uh, yeah. In my mind, it, it was always that there was just, there's like this one way. There's this yeah. perfect, it's like this narrow, like tightrope and, you know, that life is all about, no, no, you have to know exactly what that, you know, God's will is in that way. And, and like you had said, you know, being able to say, well, what do you want? What do you think that, you know, I think my, my, for me, I think I, I just, I think that I wish that my younger self knew that God was bigger. Um, yeah. That's another know, that, way. That God was bigger than theology, that God was bigger than a lot of this, because I think that stifled me for so many years, just this almost being terrified you were going to do something to like get off that path or to somehow piss off God. Um, I really thought that my little evangelical bubble was the body of Christ, you know, that, that this was just what Christians had always believed and always taught. And, Anybody that deviated from it, you know, was off course and we were just right. And and true Christians had always believed this way. Mm. And to realize now, you know, if I could go back and tell 18 year old me about, you know, the Orthodox faith <laughs> uh, in the East and, you know, even to talk about the beauty of some aspects of Catholicism and mm. to talk about the mystics or the desert fathers and patristics and, you know, just some things I've been exposed to now, not that I'm an expert, but there's a beauty mm-hmm. uh, that is so much bigger than my little evangelical bubble that I thought was everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you touching on God is bigger. It meant the reality God has created is bigger. You know, there's there's truth to be found in Buddhism mm-hmm. uh, and there's truth to be found in Islam. And though, you know, I, I haven't abandoned the exclusivity of Christ, I certainly have had my eyes opened up to be able to see him in a lot more places. And uh, I, I wish I could have captured that idea a lot sooner. Mm-hmm. You know, I would have gone I would have pursued I wanted to go to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and, and play the saxophone and, and study, you know, music production. Uh, that's what I wanted to do, but I felt called to ministry, and and I have some gifts, you know, that 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 suited me in those spaces, and so it worked. But uh, it's not what I wanted to do, and it, r- whether it was the right or wrong thing to do, the thing that fueled me was this sense of fear that I was going to miss out on the will of God, and fear was a terrible fuel for that whole journey. And I spent way too much of my life trying to get someplace fueled by fear that fear can never take me. Mm. No, you're right about that. And, and, and I think because of that fear, it, it kept us in a safe bubble, um, which, which I find that, that, which I find really funny right now, because if you watch, I hope you didn't waste some time watching the RNC um, a couple of weeks back, but, but I one thing I the, the, watch one second of it. <laughs> good, good. Did. So I, I saw recaps, but it was, that it was enough. But, um, but, uh, but during that they one of the themes they had was talking about, Oh, about the cancel culture that, yeah. that you know, they're so upset about cancel culture, but in all honesty, the church, I feel like the church is the one that like, founded cancel culture. Not really, but it feels like they have, they have, they have mastered it over the years. And then to hear like yeah. evangelicals being like, Oh, we're not happy with this. We don't like this cancel culture business. When we yeah. do it, it's fine. But when you do it, I uh, we don't like no, how it we, feels. When we decide to boycott <laughs> Disney, it's righteousness, you know. But when <laughs> yes. you, you cancel one of my heroes, then that's that's not okay. No, you know? I know it's it's. It, but I was amused. I was amused by that. But um, well, um, as as I start to kind of wrap this up, and and I, I want to know too for for where you're at right now, um, what's what's feeding you? What is feeding you in life right now? What's giving you life? Uh, options, you know, uh, to, it kind of goes back to 
that narrow path that you were talking about, feeling kind of stuck for a long time. Uh, and I got myself really unstuck and I've got mess to clean up relationally from a lot of that. Uh, but I no longer am operating under this sense of, you know, God has a tightrope for me to walk and I better walk it. Uh, I have a sense of, you know, I, I used to play the saxophone and, uh, the, the thing I loved most about jazz, there's structure in jazz, but there's so much room for improvisation. Mm. And I think that becomes a metaphor for the way we were designed to live that, you know, there's structure, there's principles to live by, but there's a lot of room for what's in your heart. And can you find a way to express that? And so, you know, I do this YouTube channel and, uh, and, and to prepare for that, I do a ton of reading and, uh, and I don't get a dime from it. You know, I think I've got 50 subscribers, so I'm not anywhere close to monetizing this thing, nor is that the goal. Uh, and very, it's not, I don't have a big crowd. I'm not getting a lot of attaboys, uh, for it, but I just enjoy the process of, and it does feed me to be able to ask the questions, to challenge the assumptions, uh, to, to at least introduce to the few people who are going to take the time to, to, to watch and listen that the reality God has created does leave a lot of room for improvisation mm-hmm. and, and freedom. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's, and it's worth leaning into that aspect of the world God has created. And that, that right now is really feeding me. I get a lot from it. Well, that actually, that was one of the most beautiful ways. I was going to try to uh, ask you more questions about the show, but I think you kind of, uh, you encapsulated what you're doing um, through a lot of the teachings. And, and even within that, like I know your most recent one, just to give people um, uh, an idea um, of what kind of content that you're putting out there. And I'll put links for this too in the description on the show. Uh, if you want to go find his YouTube channel, Alan's YouTube channel there. But like your newest one was called Hell. I don't think that word means what you think it means. So what would be what would be your... What would be your little 30 second synopsis of your, your, uh, your latest teaching? Yeah. Well, you pull up your King James Bible and it just says <laughs> hell and all those verses. And, uh, but underneath that English word, it could be, it could be Hades, which is a very Greek concept with a lot of imagery and assumptions that are packed in there. And then you've got Gehenna, uh, which is a very Jewish idea, uh, and then you've got the link between the Jewish Sheol and Hades because of the Septuagint. And then you've got Peter talking about Tartarus, <laughs> which is where the Titans were imprisoned by the Olympians. <laughs> and it's right there in our Bible, uh, as if we're supposed to just assume that that's okay. And the whole point of the teaching is that, you know, and I, I tell you, this is, this is my view about it. And so I do present that. But the point is, I spent my whole life being told that the Bible is very clear in what it teaches about hell. And it the conclusion of the teaching, it's obvious that the Bible isn't very clear in what it teaches about hell. And to me, I love that. I love the mystery of it. I love the conversation of it, the wrestling of it. Uh, I, I love that the Bible is not neat and tidy, but it's messy and complicated, and there's a process, and it unfolds. And uh, and so a lot of the teachings I do are about that sort of thing, where I'm going to take an evangelical assumption and just beat the hell out of it <laughs> with the Bible mm-hmm. to the point where if you want to be biblical, it's difficult to pretend that that's as simple as you were once told. Well, Alan, I just want to thank you so much for your time today. So, Alan, if people are wanting if people are wanting to find you or reach out to you, what, what's a good way to do that? Well, my YouTube channel is a great starting place. And uh, I don't know the URL for that, but he's going to put oh, a link yeah, to it in the I show will. notes. Yes. And then uh, <laughs> williamallensmith.com is my little blog. And so there's a, a great way to find me there as well. Awesome. Well, Alan, I'd love to have you on again sometime too. I love, I love your humility. I love your unique voice. Uh, and I love what you're doing too, man. So uh, I appreciate it. Anytime. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for being on here today, Alan. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? In the last couple minutes, I have you here on the show. For the last few minutes, I have you as a captive audience. Uh, no. Um, I don't know. I wanted just to share some kind of a thought for you to walk out into the rest of your week with. And there is, there's a song by Iron and Wine called Walking Far From Home. And in it, there's this line that's kind of just been, it kind of hung in my head, and it just, I don't know why, I keep coming back to it. But it says, it goes like this. It says, in the country where the prayers are like weeds along the road, 
And in the same sense, I, I hope that for all of us here listening, that, that our prayers, that our good deeds can be as plentiful <laughs> and can grow as well as weeds um, do along the sides of the roads in our community. And, and it, it, just, it just reminds me of, of what Paul said several times throughout the New Testament. And he said it in different ways, but it, it really kind of comes down to this. Never tire of doing good. Don't become weary in doing good. You are making a difference. Continue, continue, continue to let your goodness be plentiful like weeds along the road. Continue to do the good that you know that you need to do. Continue to be the difference that people need in your lives. Continue to be the best you that you can be. So as we end this broadcast, just a reminder that you can catch this episode and all the other ones on podcast at www.snarkyfaith.com or wherever you find or listen to podcasts because we're there. We're basically there. But my time is up and I send you all out into the world with the holiest amount of grace and snark and peace. Believe in yourself because I believe in you and go out and make a difference. I'll catch you guys again next week. I'm out of here. Peace.